Abbott Lectures uh, has been part of the ministry of the uh, Clarence J. Abbott Chair of Biblical Studies. And a number of years ago, uh, then President Land asked those of us who filled certain chairs here to design a week uh, kind of in honor of the chair, but also to lift up different ministries and emphases here at the seminary. And so the, the, uh, the Abbott Lectures have been going for a good while now. Uh, Melissa Archer uh, is a dear friend and uh, is a, a sister uh, and is a colleague. She was here for a number of years on our staff and uh, Melissa is one of those people that I had the luxury of sharing a good bit more of my life with than I often get to because she and Ken and their family attended the church in Athens. Uh, that Barb and I attend. And so we were able to not only be part of the seminary community together, uh, but we spent a lot of time in worship together, a lot of time around the altars, uh, a lot of time uh, trying to discern God's will and whether this person or that person actually spoke for God or not uh, in the community. So I know Melissa well. She had a bachelor's degree from Ashland University. Uh, a Master of Arts in Biblical Studies from Ashland Seminary, a Master of Theology from, in Biblical Studies from Columbia Theological Seminary, and uh, finished a PhD at Bangor University uh, in Wales. Melissa is a, Assistant Professor of Biblical Studies at Southeastern University. Uh, she is part of a faculty there that has had a good deal of, uh, felt a good deal of influence from this place. Uh, Rob Waddell, uh, who was with us last fall, uh, Ken Archer, amongst others, and so Melissa has been there uh, for two or three years now, I think. Uh, Melissa is uh, married to Ken Archer. She has two boys, Trent and Tyler. Uh, Trent is a music minister. Tyler is a uh, practicing nurse, RN, uh, and is a phenomenal guitar player. Uh, she has a daughter-in-law, Christina, who is about Melissa's height. Uh, so I'm always <laughs> looking up when I greet her. She is an equestrian uh, person who uh, works uh, with uh, equestrian medicine, and Trent will soon be married, and so it's a big uh, event coming up. Uh, Sister Melissa has published in a variety of venues, but most recently, uh, her PhD thesis has just seen the light of day in the last month, I think, uh, on the theme of worship in the Book of Revelation. It's a great title. I was in the spirit on the Lord's Day. Uh, it is a, it's an incredible book. We have them for sale here uh, at the, I think the price is $15. I think they list for about 20 So uh, feel free to uh, purchase one of those and we'll have a chance for Melissa to sign some of those afterwards. I'm trying to get into everything today given we don't know what tomorrow brings in terms of number of uh, inches of snow. Uh, uh, let me just say a, a final couple of words about Melissa. She's a great teacher. We have folk here who had her at, um, as a teacher at Lee. Uh, so Roland was telling me about that and was really singing her praises. I know of Melissa's reputation here at the seminary. We have some uh, alums turned back up for the lecture uh, to hear her, and we're delighted to have you here. Let me mention uh, something about Melissa's uh, PhD exam. Or viva, as we call it in the British system. Uh, my head of school said to me that it didn't seem after the first five minutes to be much of a, a defense because it was a very constructive conversation about worship in the apocalypse. One of her examiners had said to me privately, I not only uh, liked her thesis very much, was impressed with her thesis, but I admired her thesis. Uh, that is high praise, I think, uh, coming from an examiner about such a topic. This is a, this is a wonderful topic to explore, the theme of worship in the apocalypse. 
hopefully tomorrow she'll have an opportunity to do some construction uh, in terms of the Pentecostal theology of worship. Uh, it's, a, it's a remarkable piece of work. I am very, very proud of Melissa and very, very proud to have her uh, as this year's Abbott Lecture. Can you welcome her as she comes to the this lecture? Good afternoon. Wonderful to see all of you and just go ahead and keep eating. Um, I will not be offended. Let me get set up here. Well, weather is something you can't control, right? <laughs> it reminds us that we are at the mercy of the weather all the time, but I'm so happy for the opportunity to be here um, at this luncheon. And we'll pray that maybe something will work out for tomorrow as well so that we can finish this. Uh, it's really a distinct uh, honor for me to be here. Um, this feels like home. Uh, Ken and I spent 10 years here and uh, never thought we'd leave. Um, it's a wonderful place. We love this place and we love uh, so many of you here today. I can't believe I am the Abbott Lecturer. I have to say I was shocked when, when Chris invited me, but, but thank you so much for that. I do wish to thank President Vest, uh, Dr. Hahn, uh, all of the staff, the wonderful faculty uh, that is here um, for uh, both inviting me and allowing me to be in this place. I extend greetings to you from Southeastern as well as my College of Christian Ministry and Religion. Uh, they all wanted me to be sure to tell you hello. Uh, and they have great admiration for the seminary here. I'd also like to thank my parents for being here, Norm and Nancy Beatler. They've been a tremendous uh, support for me uh, my entire life, and I so appreciate them. And students, thank you. I know you didn't plan on this today, uh, but I appreciate you being here, and I hope that something that I say will be of benefit to you. I had planned to start with a testimony, and I asked Chris if it was okay if I still started with a testimony, and he said, go ahead, so I am going to go ahead and do that. And it's really a testimony to God's relentless faithfulness. In 2001, we moved our family from Ohio to Athens, Tennessee, in order for Ken to begin teaching here at what was then the Church of God School of Theology. At least I think that was the name. We kind of had some name changes. I'm pretty sure that's what it was then. The completion of his PhD was a huge milestone and is in itself a testimony. But what many did not know was that Ken and I had started PhD programs together, but that I was unable to finish never able to really get off the ground, if the truth be known. And I came to this place wounded beyond belief and unsure of what the future held for me. And as an aside, and Chris has already mentioned this, I do have to say that God led us to Woodward Church of God, which was very formative for me and for my family. And I experienced a lot of healing there. Um, and spiritually, our family grew tremendously. Both my boys were baptized in the Holy Spirit there. Uh, which will always be a wonderful um, memory for me. Anyway, Dr. Terry Cross was dean of the School of Religion at Lee University, and he hired me, a perfect stranger to him, as an adjunct instructor based on the recommendation letter from a mutual mm -hmm. colleague of ours at Ashland Theological Seminary, where I had taught for five years. I don't know what that letter said, but I'm forever grateful to Dr. Terry Flora for writing it. But it was on a particular day as I was walking from Lee to the seminary and I was reflecting on a class that I had just taught um, and it was just a, a really good class and I was just thanking the Lord for it. And I was out in front of North Cleveland Church of God, right out there on the sidewalk. And the Lord spoke to me. It was the audible voice of the Lord. I know that it was. It's the only time in my life I can say I heard the audible voice of the Lord. In fact, I turned around because I was so sure that someone had spoken to me. And the words were, this is what I've called you to do. And so it was those words that encouraged me to go on and to try again. And so I began the THM program, spent a lot of time getting some um, guidance from, from Chris, uh, from Leroy and others, and um, eventually worked my way into my second try 
at a PhD um, under the supervision of Chris Thomas. It took me six years to finish the thesis. But during those six years, the Lord brought great healing to my life, not only through the writing process itself, but also through the engagement with and encouragement of my fellow PhD students, some who are in this room today. The profound sense of community created at the seminars held at the center, right up the street, was nurturing and nourishing, both to my mind and my spirit. I began to feel that what I was writing was something that God was calling me to do. And that regardless of what the academy thought about it, I wanted my work to impact the Pentecostal church. When I successfully defended the thesis at Bangor University on January 22, 2014, Ken and I had a Pentecostal shout down in the parking lot of our Bangor <laughs> hotel. Uh, we, we really did. So for me, the publication of this thesis is so much more than a publication. It's my testimony. And I give all the glory to God. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. <coughs> worship in the apocalypse. When asked to name places in scripture containing worship passages, many come easily to mind. The Psalms, Isaiah 6, the Luke and Canticles, perhaps um, Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. One rarely thinks of the book of Revelation, at least not beyond the worship scene in Revelation 4 and 5. Revelation is the go-to book for end-time scenarios. It is the apocalypse, after all. We Pentecostals have poured over dispensational charts and have been terrorized by films depicting the rapture and the horrors of being left behind. And I have personal experience with that as a child, watching those films. And then if I would come home and my parents didn't happen to be home when I got home from school, I hid behind the couch until they got home. I was so sure I had missed the rapture. Uh, terrible. Tragically, it is the rich theology of the apocalypse that has been left behind in many Pentecostal circles. This is true when thinking about a theology of worship based on the apocalypse. However, I believe that Revelation has a great deal to offer its readers about worship. Indeed, I would argue that the whole of the apocalypse can be explored as a liturgical text. As such, it has much to contribute to a biblical theology of worship for Pentecostals. These lectures will discuss some of what the apocalypse reveals about worship and suggest ways in which it can contribute to a Pentecostal theology of worship. And so I kind of combine some of those ideas together. Worship, of course, is a central feature of Pentecostalism. In worship, Pentecostals expect to have an encounter with God. Worship for Pentecostals is a felt experience of being in the presence of God, an experience made possible by the Spirit. The Spirit orchestrates the worship encounter between the divine and the human. Indeed, true worship takes place in spirit and in truth, John 4, 24. At the heart of Pentecostal worship and spirituality is the knowledge that the worshiper is engaging in a personal encounter with the Holy Spirit. The liturgy of Pentecostalism is vibrant, dynamic, and grounded in holy expectancy. The book of Revelation can be experienced as a narrative about worship, about true worship in the spirit. Well, as a way of entering the text, allow me to share my understanding of the structure of Revelation. In recent years, many scholars have given serious attention to the four in the spirit phrases found throughout the apocalypse. As literary markers, these phrases guide the hearers through the phases of John's vision, while at the same time providing continuity to the whole of the narrative. These phrases also ground the apocalypse pneumatologically by highlighting the role of the Spirit. Liturgically, the, the phrases point to the role of the Spirit as the facilitator of worship for both John and his hearers. Along with the prologue and the epilogue, these phrases suggest the following large units as a way of structuring the narrative. And I realize you're not seeing these written down, but I will give them to you anyway. Mm -hmm. So we have a prologue, uh, Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. And then we have the first in the spirit phrase, um, Revelation 1, verse 9, that extends clear through chapter 3, verse 22, which takes in the prophetic messages to the churches. The second in the spirit phrase occurs in uh, 4.1, where John is taken into heaven via the spirit and extends clear through chapter 16.21. So in that section, we have the, um, 
the three series of judgment. We also have alternating visions of worship. We have chapters 12 through 14, which kind of comprise the heart of what the apocalypse wants to talk about with worship. So we have this large section. The third in the spirit phrase is from 17.1 to 21.8, where John is taken in the spirit into the wilderness where he sees Babylon, the harlot. The fourth in the spirit phrase is 21.9 through 22.5, and John is taken in the spirit this time to a mountain from which he sees New Jerusalem descending out of heaven. And then the epilogue finishes out the book in 22.6 through 21. Let's talk about the apocalypse as a liturgical narrative. On a structural level, worship is woven into the very fabric of the narrative. Every section of the apocalypse contains liturgical material. In the prologue, a liturgical blessing is pronounced upon the reader and the hearers of the prophecy in Revelation 1, verse 3. This suggests a liturgical context, a worship service, in which the apocalypse would be read to the church as part of their worship. All within the community are invited to participate, suggesting that reading and hearing and keeping the prophecy are to be considered liturgical activities within the churches. The epistolary greeting to the seven churches is infused with liturgical language as grace and peace are extended to the churches from God, from the spirit before God's throne, and from Jesus. So we get this wonderful language from the one who was and is and is to come, from Jesus, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler, uh, the kings of the ruler, uh, the ruler of the kings of the earth, and from the spirit who is before the throne. So it's not just a normal greeting, it's a greeting that is saturated with liturgical language. The prologue continues with a liturgical doxology to Jesus in 1, 5b through 6. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. There's a prophetic word of Jesus' return cast in liturgical form in verse 7. Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. And finally, the prologue concludes with a direct word from God in verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So the entirety of the prologue is just one liturgical statement after the other. Following the prologue, the use of the four in the spirit phrases that divide the phases of the vision suggests that the spirit be seen as facilitating John's vision. John's claim that he received the vision in the spirit on the Lord's day is key. Richard Bauckham, who writes at length on John's experience, states this. John was in the spirit in the sense that his normal sensory experience was replaced by visions and auditions given him by the spirit. For Bauckham, the phrase highlights the spirit's role as agent of visionary experience and links, links John's experience with Old Testament figures such as Isaiah or Ezekiel. Zechariah and Enoch. It is possible, however, that more is being communicated in John's statement of being in the spirit, particularly given the apocalypse's liturgical setting and the profusion of liturgical material in the prologue. John's statement of being in the spirit on the Lord's day suggests two things. First, John was observing in solidarity with the churches the day for worship. Thus, just as the churches would be gathered for worship on the Lord's Day, so too was John worshiping, even while exiled on Patmos. Second, being in the Spirit on the Lord's Day was a normal experience of worship for John. Note the simple and unassuming nature of his statement. He expects his audience to understand what it means to be in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Johanna and hearers might recall Jesus' statement about worship being in spirit and truth. In describing himself as being in the spirit, John is making a statement about the significance of worship as the point of contact between heaven and earth. It is in worship that spirit-inspired revelation is given both to John and to the seven churches. I have to say, too, that one of the things that um, really stuck out to me as I was doing my work was when I was looking at the early Pentecostal literature. And the third chapter of the, of the, of the book um, is, is 
um, they write about comes as a result of their spirit baptism experience. So they have this profound experience with the spirit that then leads them into visions and dreams. They're writing music, they're composing poems, they're doing all of these things in the spirit. They're taking up into the throne room. So it's this experience of worship. And I remember being at Trace Hermanos with, with Chris and Leroy, and I said, what if that's what John's talking about? What if it's not just that he's in a trance um, and receiving these experiences, but he, that he was actually in a state of worship, and that in that state of worship, he has these experiences. And so uh, that really kind of prejudiced my reading in, in the apocalypse, but I really think it sets the tone for the liturgical setting of the apocalypse. The seven prophetic messages yield new insights when viewed through the lens of the liturgical setting established in Revelation chapter 1. I see five aspects related to worship in the prophetic messages. First, the presence of the living Jesus is in the midst of the churches. Second, communal repentance is a key liturgical activity, indicating that the churches have heard and obeyed the voice of Jesus in their midst. Third, worship creates a context for prophetic words and pneumatic discernment. Fourth, faithful witness is worship. And five, worship in the spirit collapses the time between the present and the future as expressed in the experience of the eschatological rewards to the overcomers. I will briefly elaborate on the first point. By means of the ascriptions that begin each message, the churches are to understand that the presence of the living Jesus, the one who appeared to John as standing in the midst of the candlesticks, which are the churches, is indeed in their midst. Each ascription is a designation of or a declaration about Jesus, taken from the first chapter of Revelation, that takes on meaning particular to each message. As each message unfolds, the churches discover another reason to worship Jesus. Collectively, the ascriptions create a liturgy, a doxological confession about Jesus. Thus, Jesus is the one who holds them in his hand in 2-1. The one who is the first and the last. The Son of God, the one who is holy and true. The Amen, and so forth. The presence of Jesus in their midst is further expressed in Jesus' statements of judgment if the church does not respond to his words of rebuke. These statements are found in four of the seven messages and are often connected to repentance. If you don't repent, I will come to you. In light of the four statements, Jesus indicates that he will come to them if they do not repent, suggesting that the hearers must give urgent and immediate attention not only to Jesus' words, but also to his presence among them. The apocalypse is filled with liturgical vocabulary, words such as laturo for worship or service, forms of proskuneo for all our Greek students in here, uh, appear over and over again in the apocalypse. The liturgical acclamations of amen and alleluia are found in the apocalypse. Liturgical forms such as doxology, blessings, there's seven of them, and the benediction at the end, combined with liturgical images of incense, altar, and temple, suggestive of formal elements within a worship service with, with which the hearers would be familiar. Over and over, the hearers are confronted with images of worship designed to affirm and bolster their own worship practices. Further, the apocalypse is replete with hymns of worship and the liturgical posture of prostration, prostration of falling down before the throne. Worship scenes are embedded in the narrative. These scenes are tied directly to the narratives around them and aid the hearers in interpreting and discerning them, always from heaven's correct perspective. So, for example, the worship scene in chapter 7 verses 9 through 17, identifies the great multitude as the martyrs. So the worship helps us to understand what John is seeing in the narrative. Uh, even in the hymn, the first hymn of chapter 4, where John is in the throne room and he sees one sitting on the throne, we don't get a direct identification that this is God, but the first hymn tells us that. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then the second hymn, celebrating God as creator. So, so the hymns really function to help 
us to interpret what is happening in the narrative that they are in. The juxtaposition of scenes of heavenly worship with scenes of judgment upon the inhabitants of the earth is intended to demonstrate to the hearers that whatever they might face while on earth, true reality is what is taking place in heaven. It is only from heaven's perspective where God and the Lamb rule and are just in all of their judgments that the scenes of judgment can be properly assessed. The alternate reality created by the worship scenes is differentiated from the earthly reality of false worship that is given to and demanded by the dragon, the beast, and even Babylon in Revelation 13 through 18. Throughout the apocalypse, it is worship that reveals one's allegiance. Mm -hmm. Revelation presents worship as the definitive act of Christian resistance to any and all that are opposed to God. Mm -hmm. The epilogue bears similarities to the prologue, yet even the epilogue's rehearsal of key elements in the apocalypse is expressed through liturgical language that reinforces the framework of John's writing, as well as the liturgical setting of John's churches in which it is heard and experienced. In the epilogue, liturgical blessings are pronounced by Jesus in 22, 7 and 14, thus assuring the churches that he is still standing in their midst. Their response to Jesus' thrice-repeated announcement of his soon return in 22, 7, 12, and 20 couples the liturgical amen with the liturgical prayer of longing for the return of their Lord, Jesus. The closing benediction in verse 21 both reflects Revelation's epistolary nature and serves as a conclusion to the entire worship setting of the narrative, likely based on the benediction spoken as a conclusion to the church's own worship services. The benediction upon all is communal, an open-ended offer of grace to all who would hear and respond and thus become followers of the Lamb. The benediction, then, is not a perfunctory ending to John's letter, but a profound theological statement of hope for all who would worship God and the Lamb. This initial observation about the liturgical structure of the apocalypse is instructive for Pentecostals if for no other reason than it opens up the possibility of a fresh reading of the apocalypse that is freed from the chains of a dispensationalist reading. Early Pentecostals were profoundly affected by the worship found in the apocalypse. In their own encounters with the Spirit, they experienced the apocalypse in ways not unlike John. In recognizing the liturgical fabric of the apocalypse, contemporary Pentecostals can both rediscover and retrieve it as a resource for their own worship. The second area I'd like to talk about is that worship takes place in the spirit. Although this has been mentioned above, it's so essential that it bears repeating. John's statement of being in the spirit is a profound statement both about worship and the central role of the Holy Spirit. Worship is an engagement with and participation in the Spirit of God. Worship in the Spirit turns ordinary places like Patmos and the seven churches of Asia into sacred spaces and ordinary time into eschatological time. Worship is not confined to a designated time or place. Rather, true worship takes place whenever and wherever one is communing with God in the Spirit. Thus, John stands in solidarity and in the spirit with the seven churches in worshiping God, even though exiled on Patmos. John is in the spirit because worship takes place in the spirit. It is in the spirit that John is granted a vision of the living Jesus in chapter 1, verses 9 through 18. In the prophetic messages to the churches, it is in the spirit that the churches hear the voice of Jesus who is in their midst. Although each message indicates that it is Jesus, the one who appeared to John who was speaking to them, and it's probably in red letters in your Bible, so we know for sure, right? <laughs> that Jesus is speaking and revealing intimate knowledge of their worship practices, each message concludes with an imperatible call to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. In this way, the words of Jesus and the words of the Spirit are coterminous. To hear what the Spirit is saying is to hear the very words of Jesus. It is in the Spirit that the transcendent God is made imminent, and the churches find themselves, along with John, in the realm of heaven, where they see, hear, and experience its liturgy repeatedly. It is in the Spirit that the churches ascertain their true identity as New Jerusalem, the wife of the Lamb, in 21, 2, and 9, despite the fact that they are currently residing in Babylon, who is the consort of the dragon. 
Worship in the spirit creates a context for pneumatic discernment, a crucial liturgical task for the people of God. The apocalypse's claim that worship takes place in and through the spirit is quite conducive for Pentecostals, who above all define themselves as people of the spirit and understand their worship to be spirit-directed. Pentecostals view worship as an experiential encounter, thus they value experiences in worship. Pentecostals can find in the apocalypse confirmation that true worship is experiential, involving the whole person, body, mind, and spirit, in encounter with God in the spirit. In the apocalypse, the experience of worship is that which will mark the hearers as followers of the Lamb, as theologically formed worshipers who understand that their own worship is to be a proleptic participation in the sights, sounds, and activities of the heavenly realm. In this way, spirited worship engages the imagination. Pentecostal worship should be a holy, H-O-L-Y, a holy, imaginative experience. Spirited worship is also sensory. John sees the lamb, he hears the trumpets, he smells the incense, he tastes the scroll, he touches the measuring rod. In the same way, Pentecostals can find an invitation to a spirited sensory experience of worship, an experience of worship as ritual play, whereby the spirit takes them into the throne room to worship before God and the lamb. Early Pentecostals testified to receiving songs and poems in the spirit, and the inclusion of these in their published periodicals attest to their understanding that they were spirit given and intended for worship. I just wanted to read one example of that. I have to put my glasses on for this one. <laughs> in the apostolic faith, which is what came out of the Azusa Street Revival, there is this testimony that comes to us in 1908. It's a little bit lengthy, but I think it's really good. Uh, a woman uh, that I'm not sure of her name, Antoinette Mumin, recounts her experience of spirit baptism in which the Lord showed her the cross. And then she says the following, One morning the Spirit dealt with me, singing through me. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone, and there is one for me. The last line, he just seemed to burn into my soul by repeating it over and over again. Sometimes the Spirit would sing a line and then sob out a line. Although I wept and was in anguish of soul, it was all in the Spirit. I think her testimony speaks to that sense that the early Pentecostals had, that worship afforded this deep connection to the Spirit, and that they were giving voice to the words and the longings of the Spirit. I think that's such a, a powerful example. So when we're talking about this important, um, this important element of worship in the Spirit and expressing what the Spirit wants to speak into the community through worship. In the same way, present-day Pentecostal communities should encourage and intentionally incorporate artwork, poetry, banners, incense, or other items designed to engage both the imagination and the senses as expressions of spirited worship. The third area I'd like to look at is uh, legitimate and illegitimate worship as a theme in the apocalypse. Fundamental to the apocalypse is that God alone is to be worshipped which includes the worship of Jesus and the Spirit. And I wish we had time to kind of talk about all of that, um, but, but we don't. So you have to see it in the book. <laughs> the twice-repeated injunction, Worship God, in 1910 and 22.9, reverberates as the heart of the narrative. John's attempt to worship a being other than God, and we find this in a couple of places, in 1910 and 22.9, and also in 17.6, where he marvels at Babylon gives indication to the hearers of the subtle nature of false worship. The theme of false worship first appears in the prophetic messages when the hearers are confronted with the realization that false worship has infiltrated their sacred spaces through the false teachers or prophets Balaam in the message to Pergamum and Jezebel in the message to Thyatira, who intentionally seek to lure the churches into idolatrous practices. 
Then, after the events connected to the sixth trumpet, John records that the inhabitants of earth did not stop worshiping demons and idols in 9, uh, 920. In Revelation 12 through 13, illegitimate worship is fully exposed as the hearers encounter the dragon and his beasts. This evil trinity, a perverse parody of the triune God, launches a full-scale campaign aimed at turning all of humanity from the worship of God by demanding worship of the beast. It is at this point that humanity is divided into two camps, those who give their worship to the beast and sing who is like the beast in chapter 13, verse 4, and those who refuse to worship the beast and are killed, chapter 13, verse 15. So chapter 13 really is this pivotal chapter that's loaded with worship language, but it's worship that is directed at the dragon and the beasts. And prior to this, worship is only reserved for God. So it's a very important chapter. So the inhabitants of the earth are those who follow after the dragon. The followers of the lamb are the ones following after the lamb. And because they refuse to worship the beast, of course, forfeit their life. It's a very powerful chapter. As if this were not enough, in Revelation 17, the hearers are confronted with another entity demanding their worship and allegiance, Babylon the harlot. The sight of her is so wondrous that John's amazement teeters on worship, even while fully cognizant that she is drunk on the blood of the saints. Worship becomes a decisive test of allegiance. That is, the followers of God and the Lamb and the followers of the dragon, the beast, and Babylon are marked by their worship. We see a nice contrast of this um, in uh, chapter 13 going into chapter 14 as well. So, for example, um, in chapter 7, verse 3, the 144,000 bear the seal of God upon their forehead in that interlude. In chapter 13, verse 16, the followers of the beast worship him and are identified by the mark upon their hand or their forehead, while those who refuse to worship are killed, but are then portrayed in chapter 14, verse 3, as alive and having the mark of God and the Lamb on their foreheads, just as promised to the overcomers in chapter 3, verse 12. So again, it speaks to the crucial issue of worship. True and false worship leads people to specific eternal destinies in the apocalypse. The followers of the beast are cast into the lake of fire, chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. The followers of the Lamb enter into and are New Jerusalem in Revelation 21 through 22. The fate of the followers of the beast is not predetermined, as evidenced in the proclamations of the three angels in Revelation 14, who proclaim the same message to everyone, worship God, chapter 14, verse 7. Further, they announce the fate of Babylon before it happens, 14:8. And the fate of those who choose to worship the beast, again, before it happens in 14, 9 through 11. Who to worship thereby becomes a conscious and informed choice on the part of the worshiper. The thread of what constitutes true and false worship woven throughout the apocalypse is not just to show the fate of those who follow the beast, for the apocalypse is written for the churches. We find that at the beginning and at the end, that this book, this letter, is for the churches. It is the people of God who must diligently guard against the subtle and blatant pressure to render worship to anyone or anything other than God and the Lamb. This is why the churches are first taken up into heaven, to fall before the God of all creation and the Lamb, their Redeemer, as John experiences it. They here participate in the thunderous worship given to God and the Lamb. To them is shown the outcome of their perseverance and their refusal to worship the beast in the multiple portrayals of the martyrs in heaven uh, that we find in chapter 7, chapter 14, chapter 15. Um, the idea that the church in Revelation is a martyr church, uh, I think, is, is a song that Revelation sings out, uh, to borrow the analogy of the black gospel choir from Dr. Thomas. It's a great analogy, and I use it all the time. Um, this, is, this is something that the apocalypse um, wants to say. And that kind of makes us uncomfortable. But, but the church in the apocalypse is a martyr church. It is the, in the context of dying for refusing to worship the beast that the hearers realize the true blessedness of those who die in the Lord. Revelation 14, 13. 
For it is the martyrs, those who refuse to worship the beast, who are alive in heaven, singing the song known only to them in 14.3, and the song of Moses and the Lamb in 15, one through four. It is by engaging in the liturgy of heaven that John's hearers are to counter the false liturgies around them. And I might add as well, it's in another section, but the, the purpose is also so that the church can call the nations to repentance. The desire in the apocalypse is that the world comes to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so I think that's a really strong theme and we often just think about all the destruction but the judgments are designed to bring people to repentance. And so the fact that they don't repent becomes a really striking statement about the condition of their heart. And it's when the witness of the church is coupled with these um, um, scenes of judgment that we begin to see the inhabitants of the earth giving glory to God and repenting. Um, the kings of the earth at the end come into New Jerusalem bringing their glory, suggesting that they haven't aligned with the beast, that they have responded to the witness of the church, and they have indeed become followers of the Lamb. So it's a very positive picture of the conversion of the nations, which I think is important also for us as Pentecostals who believe that witness is very important. For Pentecostals, the temptation towards false worship might seem irrelevant. After all, Pentecostals seek above all else an authentic and experiential encounter with God. Pentecostals, however, should certainly discern whether or not they are unwittingly engaging in or being led into false worship. It can come in the guise of elevating Pentecostal pastors or leaders onto platforms from which the glory reserved for God is wrongly attributed to or accepted by them. It can happen in worship where style is worshiped more than the triune God. It can happen when buildings are built to the glory of God, but then the community has no resources or desire to engage the world outside its doors. The rising popularity and growing acceptance of Pentecostalism into the mainstream of American culture likely offers the most subtle temptation. Mm -hmm. While the apocalypse calls John's hearers to resist the trappings of Babylon, it calls present-day Pentecostals to resist the trappings of current culture. Jamie Smith in Desiring the Kingdom talks about modern cultural practices as secular liturgies. He says, we need to recognize that these practices are not neutral or benign, but rather intentionally loaded to form us into certain kinds of people, to unwittingly make us disciples of rival kings and patriotic citizens of rival kingdoms. The liturgies of the culture around John's hearers had the potential to lure them away from the true worship of God. Thus, the urgent call to come out of Babylon in chapter 18, verse 4, sounds forth. Similar, similarly, the liturgies of modern-day culture wear away at Pentecostal self-identity by demanding that Pentecostals accommodate themselves to the trends of contemporary culture. The apocalypse advocates for the followers of the Lamb to refuse to engage in false worship and to self-identify as overcomers, those willing to lose their lives for the sake of the Lamb. Early Pentecostals shared this understanding. And I want to read to you a quote from William Seymour in 1907. This is what he wrote. Oh, beloved, our reigning time has not come yet. We are to be with the babe from the manger to the throne. Our reigning time will come when Jesus comes in great power from the throne. Until then, we are to be beaten, to be spit upon, and mocked. We are to be like his son. It's a powerful statement. Yes. Present-day Pentecostals are uncomfortable with this perspective. Pentecostals must engage in critical self-reflection to ensure that we are not participating or in any way fostering any type of false worship. Pentecostals might also reflect on ways in which their liturgy can engage the imagination of the worshipers so that the culture of New Jerusalem so fills their heart and minds that the contemporary culture of Babylon loses all the Lord. The call of the Spirit to come out of Babylon is for every generation of hearers to heed. Ever in the hearts and minds of Pentecostals must be the mantra of the apocalypse, worship God. How much time do we have? Got another five or ten minutes. Okay. Let me do one more part and then we'll stop. Does that sound okay? All right. I have to put my glasses on again. Oh, our last point, and then hopefully I'll get to share the rest tomorrow. Um, we'll see. 
But another thing that I think is uh, striking in the apocalypse is that worship is the central purpose for all of creation, whether in heaven or on earth. It is not insignificant that the first thing John sees and hears in heaven is worship rendered to God and the Lamb, Revelations 4 and 5. The songs of worship begun by the elders and living creatures crescendo as the angels and then all of creation add their voices to produce a symphony of praise to God and the Lamb. This scene anticipates the eschatological goal for all creation to worship God and the Lamb. As the vision progresses, John is shown scene after scene of heavenly worship where God and the Lamb continue to be lauded for their character and for their works. In many of the worship scenes, John also sees the overcomers, those who while on earth gave their lives for the Lamb, worshiping around the throne in heaven. Again, chapter 7, chapter 14, chapter 15. That those who refuse to worship the beast on earth are put to death, but then found to be alive and around the throne, reinforces for the hearers the primacy of worship, both while on earth and continuing in heaven. That the overcomers are in the presence of God and fully engaged in worship, bolsters the hearers in their own practice of worship, even in the midst of potential suffering. The worship of, of heaven is thereby paradigmatic and pedagogical, for worship is the primary purpose of the people of God and forms a crucial component of the witness of the church in the world. Additionally, the apocalypse portrays for the hearers the goal of worship, to be New Jerusalem, to be intimately united with God and the Lamb in a state of unhindered worship and adoration. John's hearers are invited to enter into an alternative reality, an escape from their present situation. Likewise, Pentecostal worship offers an escape to the worshiper into ultimate reality. The testimony of early Pentecostals that they suddenly found themselves transported to the throne of God or they saw the table spread for the marriage supper of the Lamb affirms what the apocalypse has portrayed, namely that in worship, the boundary between the present and the future is breached. The Spirit transports the worshipers back and forth between heaven and earth. The Apocalypse's revelation of worship in its various expressions, hymns, musical instruments, prayers, words of silence, all, all kinds of things that hopefully we can talk about tomorrow, um, as the featured activity of heaven and thereby a crucial task of the church, invites Pentecostals to evaluate both their definition of worship and its role within the communities. Simon Chan calls Pentecostals to the discerning task of examining what they are practicing in worship. He identifies two models of worship in the contemporary Pentecostal church, the charismatic model and the evangelical model. And this is a quote from him. The charismatic model is usually organized around the singing of praises as seen in the way the contemporary worship service is called prayer and praise or praise and worship. When worship is largely reduced to a string of praise ditties, the aim of worship subtly shifts from encountering God to mood creation and possibly psychological manipulation. Those are his words. In the evangelical model, worship is reduced to preaching. Singing is only a preparation to hear the sermon. Reductionistic worship simply practices a reductionistic theology, even when the church's theology may be theoretically sound. Well, the apocalypse refuses reductionistic worship by offering a robust theology of worship by which Pentecostals might measure and develop their own theology of worship, a theology of experience and encounter that places authentic, spirited worship of God at its heart. Further, Pentecostals should view worship as a formational and catechetical rite, R-I-T-E, not R-I-G-H-T. Cheryl Bridges Johns calls the Pentecostal church to see itself as the primary agent of conscientization. Is that how you say that word? <laughs> Ooh, I have practiced that word a lot. <laughs> As such, the community helps the believer to understand reality in a new way and to see himself or herself as actors in, both his, uh, in history of both the church and the world. The liturgical elements common to Pentecostals, which serve to initiate and instruct believers, are the means by which this new reality is constructed and maintained. She urges Pentecostals, this is still Cheryl, to envision worship as formation. As worshipers participate in the rituals of Pentecostal worship, they are incorporated, enculturated, and apprenticed. They are also transformed in as much as the liturgies are alive with the power of the Holy Spirit. The church retains its prophetic identity, maintaining an ongoing dialectic between itself 
and the socio-political environment in which it exists, and that is Cheryl. The apocalypse is for the churches who, by their worship and witness, are to be agents of conscientization among the inhabitants of the earth. As the churches participate in and appropriate for themselves the worship of, of heaven, they are incorporated, enculturated, and apprenticed. Not only are the worshipers incorporated into communion with God, but also into communion with fellow worshipers, because there's people from every tribe, nation, people, and tongue worshiping around the throne. So they are incorporated with fellow worshipers, both in their own pew and with those around the world. It is a global body. Worship serves as an apprenticeship for that day when worshipers from every tribe and tongue will stand around the throne and worship God and the Lamb. The lure of Babylon fades, the magnificence of New Jerusalem beckons, and it takes place in worship. Amen. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Melissa. Wonderful uh, presentation. We want to take a little bit of time for some engagement, and I will just uh, pull a chair up, and Melissa can take care of herself. But this fight's break out. You know, it's good to have the director around. Uh, so uh, let's just open it up, and I'll let you um, field the questions, Melissa. Thanks. I told my dad he couldn't ask me any hard questions. So. <laughs> well, where's David Johnson? Oh, Dr. Rodgers. Yes. Uh, Dr. Rodgers, thank you very much. That's a stimulating lesson. Thank you. Uh, one thing I jumped off. One of the things that jumped at me, which you probably might want to expand upon a little bit, is worship as a form of resistance. Uh, I, I have not used that yeah. statement, worship as a form of resistance, a revelation. Could you talk a little bit more about it? Yeah, well, I, I think that is um, kind of the crucial piece. And again, I think chapter 13 becomes kind of the main exegesis of that so that those who refuse to worship are, are put to death. Um, and so this whole, this whole concept between all of the worship that's gone on in the apocalypse, so all the declarations about who God is, um, what God has done, all the celebrations of God that come in the midst of these um, uh, scenes of, of judgment and things like that, um, I think are intended to help the John's hearers to know that no matter what's happening, their task is to be continuing to worship God. Um, if there are those that are demanding worship that are not God or the Lamb, right, not directed at God and the Lamb, then that is to be resisted. So it's through their worship, it's not through swords, it's not through, you know, political activism. In the apocalypse, it is through worship that they either are identified as a follower of the Lamb or, or not. Um, and so I think that becomes... I think that becomes very striking. I think it speaks to the power of liturgy, uh, maybe in ways that we haven't thought about um, what happens and how then does that become um, you know, our, our witness to the world. So we're not compartmentalizing. We don't worship and witness. It's together. Our worship is our witness. And so as much as just um, you know, speaking words of testimony, our singing, our prayers, our, our everything that we do becomes witness to God and the Lamb. And so I think that becomes um, a, a, really, a, a really strong theme um, that maybe we haven't kind of considered as much. I don't know if that answers what... I mean, it just sent me thinking in light of contemporary society and all that. So, I mean, it's something to think about. I appreciate that. Thank I mean, you. How, how does it work out today? You said that's something to think about. It's very powerful. I yeah, I, I, I really do think it is. And I mean, you even think of events going on, you know, in our in our world currently. Um, I, I can't help thinking of people in the world that probably are reading Revelation and saying, "Here I am, right? I, th this is happening, you know, to me right now." And we have a a little different perspective in the American church. Um, and and so I I think that that this calls us as the American church maybe to. Uh, rethink what, what we're doing, that our worship needs to be intentional. 
and then it needs to be, um, you know, it needs to do all of those things that, that, that Cheryl talks about. It needs to be the way that we are incorporating people. What does it mean to be a follower of the Lamb? Well, it might mean that you end up giving your, giving your life for the Lamb. Yes? As we're intentional about our worship, how can we be intentional about falling into the false worship of the dragon and the beast of that one? You mentioned some stuff with Jamie Smith talking about like secular liturgies that kind of go elsewhere. Can you speak to that a little bit? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I think that, uh, I think we have to be careful uh, to remember our identity, our primary identity as Christians, as followers of the Lamb. So, um, you know, John is talking to, obviously, a community that's living in the Roman Empire, emperor worships going on, all kinds of pressures upon them to uh, give worship to the empire or to, you know, do things like that. So we can look at it and go, oh, that's not our world. We don't have to deal with that. But I think there are subtle ways that even American, the American empire, and I, you know, I, I don't feel real confident to go on at length about that, but I think there are subtle ways in which even the American empire um, is calling for our allegiance. Uh, and even, even in the church, um, and so I think it comes to us, I think it comes to us really in, in subtle fashion, um, things that we pledge allegiance to um, when our allegiance belongs to, to, to the Lord. So I, I think it's just something that we have to practice discernment on. And so you get these calls to discernment that ring out throughout the narrative that I know David is working on that I think will help us in, in, in continuing to answer questions like that. Because I think it's a, I think it's a really important question. And there's a book, I think it's Craville, Apocalypse and Allegiance, and he, he lays it out. He, he really goes into a lot of detail. You'd probably be really interested in it. Um, but talking about even our worship songs in America, you know, um, that we sing as liturgies that are kind of drawing our attention to extol the wonder and majesty of the empire rather than the wonder and majesty of God. Yes. Do you feel John 4.24 speaks more of the positional side of that identity? Um, mm -hmm. Your new nature, being born again, spirit and truth? Sure, sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, think that's, I think that's good. And, uh, um, you know, worshiping in the spirit. And if truth is Jesus, as Paulus and Dr. Thomas, I know, uh, talk a lot about, then, then yeah, we kind of get this, this, dual, this dual focus. Um, so it seems really clear in, in Revelation that that is true. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Um, Archer, I just want to thank you because I'm sitting here listening to your lecture and I thought I was going to have to get up and walk out because <laughs> it's years away. Get ready to go down my face. Um, and just for bringing out um, the, and I know that others have as well, the worship side of I mean, it's just giving me a new perspective. We're always talking about the destructive part, but thank you so much for bringing this whole thing about leadership, and I just can't wait to get back into Revelation again. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Melissa, would you, uh, you, you mentioned this earlier, but would you <coughs> reflect a little bit on what your experience was like and what what it contributed to you, you know what's coming. Uh, reading through those early Pentecostal comments on Revelation texts that talk about worship. Yeah. yeah th this is a question Chris used to ask me all the time. Uh, what, is, what is this doing to you? And for a while I really didn't have an answer for him. I didn't know what it was doing to me. I was just, you know, over my head in, in reading all the literature, which is why I now have to wear glasses uh, from reading all that tiny print. <laughs> but it really was this extraordinary process uh, because when I started, I thought, oh, what did the early Pentecostals think about the book of Revelation? Well, surely they're going to talk about who's that, you know, who's the Antichrist, what's the number of the beast. I really thought it was just all going to be kind of eschatological. Um, 
end time scenario stuff. And at some point it does get to that. It, 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 it does kind of move into some of those. But those, that first 10 years, which is such a crucial period uh, for, for Pentecostalism, it didn't matter if I was reading um, the Apostolic Faith or if I was reading an early pre-AG um, magazine. The experiences were the same. So even though there's going to be some doctrinal differences that develop, this experience of worship kind of knit them together. So as they were largely recounting their experiences of salvation or spirit baptism, testimonies of healing, uh, those types of things that are happening in the community, these statements about worship, they're all having these similar experiences. You know, they're, 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 they're being slain in the spirit, and they're appealing to Revelation as, as proof that that is appropriate. So they're being slain in the spirit, and while they are doing that, you know, they're in the throne room over and over and over again. That's what they talk about. They are before the throne. Um, they see the table spread for the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's a testimony in one of uh, a, a woman in Africa. No knowledge about Christianity whatsoever. She walks into this church. She has an encounter with God. She gets slain in the spirit. And when she comes back to, she tells about this, um, this big seat that she saw with this beautiful person sitting on it with, with water coming out from beneath it. I mean, she's describing the throne. She's describing, you know, the, the, the river of life coming, coming forth and the table that she sees spread. I mean, you might be able to look at some of it and say, well, they just read a lot of revelation. And so that's what they recounted. But then you come across testimonies like that where what they're experiencing is what we're seeing in the book of Revelation. So that, that just says that there was something powerful happening. Um, and so what we find in Revelation um, is, it's beyond just mere description. Mm -hmm. It's something we're meant to participate in. Yes, yeah. yes. And so for me, right now, I can't read Revelation differently. I can't see anything else in Revelation. <laughs> Uh, except for this, this, this theme of worship and how vital and crucial worship is. And that worship has to be directed to God in the Lamb. It can't be about me. It has to be about God. We can't be vague in our lyrics. We, we have to be intentional in what it is that we, um, that we are presenting as worship. Yes, Leroy. So what does that say about the unity of the Christian faith amongst all the different diverse manifestations mm. where, yes, does, that's where does unity lie well that's a great question I, I would say unity um, lies in um, our our spirituality maybe our, our experiences um, what what we what we experience um, and I think the early literature really you know, really kind of speaks to that because you'd have people from all kinds of persuasions who were coming into these new into these new revivals. You know, so the fact that we have worship wars to me is just that's a tragedy. We shouldn't be having worship wars. We should be united in you know in what we're doing ac across the board, whether we're Pentecostal or Methodist or Baptist or whatever. It seems to me that that, that has to be something that's fundamental um, to to what we do. What we do, and I do want to mention just because. Um, Chris Green is in here, that, uh, and since I, I probably won't get to do this tomorrow, but um, it seems like there are some allusions to uh, the Eucharist easy, in, easy. Oh. Don't, don't. <laughs> in the apocalypse. So we have to mention that <laughs> because Chris, Chris talks about, you know, the Eucharist is being the hearth around which all the other furniture in the room is uh uh, is, is arranged, which I, think, which I think is so great, and I've used your stuff at Southeastern, so thank you for that. Um, but um, one of the one of the commentators says that he sees the apocalypse as enacting what happens in the Eucharist, which I think is just a really powerful thing. So, so that we we have this picture of of, of Jesus and um, the, the victory that is won through the cross, the, the the overcoming of evil, and so when we celebrate the Eucharist, and this would be one of the rites that Cheryl talks about. Um, partaking of the Lord's Supper together. What a powerful experience that becomes to read it in conjunction with what we find in the, in the book of Revelation. So that it is this, um, it is this holy, again, H-O-L-Y, imaginative engagement that we have as the body of Christ. Uh, and so I think that's a, that's a powerful thing. So references to eating of the hidden manna 
or to eating from the tree of life, a lot of imagery of eating and drinking. So, so possibly, again, that becomes something that the church is experiencing while they are celebrating um, the Lord's Supper in their own community. And so what a powerful thing for us as well to do. So I think that's good. Yes, Dr. Hahn. Well, it is really interesting that um, you know, the, uh, Dr. Martin raises the question of unity of faith. And your reading on the book of Revelation is all about worship, the liturgical reading of the, of the book of Revelation. You know, uh, Dr. John, Cheryl Johns and I have talked about this in the past, and, and I think others of you as well have been to different kind of ecumenical conferences and meetings. And we are all gathering to talk about unity of faith. But one thing we cannot do together is celebrating Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. That is one thing that really should capture the unity of faith. Yes. You know, that eschatological tension you read in the book of mm -hmm. Revelation is lived out in real life. Yes. And that's a tragedy. And it, it kind of, you know, uh, instead of simply you know, stopping there, I think it gives us, uh, I guess, more incentives to work toward to bring in the eschatological kingdom into the present. Yes. Despite Absolutely. the harsh realities that divide the community of Christian faith. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think that's so, I think that's so true. Thank you for that. I think too, um, and stop me if we're out of time. Um, again, because I don't know if we're going to talk about this tomorrow, but uh, I'm, I'm really convinced, I didn't used to be, um, again, I think it's because I just read kind of all the, the terror and judgment that, that takes place in, in Revelation. I'm not saying that it's not there. Um, but I think it has to be properly interpreted in light of uh, the, the liturgy and the worship that's going on. And also uh, the, the fact that the book of Revelation is addressed to the churches. To the churches, um, the eternal destiny of, of people is depicted. So um, that becomes the motivation for us to witness, right? So we don't celebrate um, the followers of the beast being cast into the lake of fire. We call people from that, just like those uh, angelic warnings in chapter 14. Those precede what happens, and then what happens is exactly what the angels predicted. And so part of our witness again, and when John has to ingest the scroll and told you must prophesy again concerning you know, people's tribes and, and nations, it is that. That, that that is what we are called to do. We have this text to say, hey, we, we always say we know the end and, and we win, and, and that's true. But it's also um, that, that, that we want to snatch people from the fire, right? It's a good Pentecostal term. Because once Jesus returns, uh, if that is the picture of, of, of um, Revelation 19, then we go into this series of events where you don't, you know, you're, you're kind of locked in. And so that becomes a very crucial point in, in the narrative. So the return of Jesus, which we have heard is coming throughout the narrative, um, becomes so decisive. And so the task of witness uh, as a community, witnessing in all ways, witnessing in what we do, reminding ourselves that um, we're called to um, work for the conversion of the nations, I think is really important. Yes? I'm not the scholar you are. But is this not referring, Dr. <coughs> Hahn referred to it, Chris has referred to it, sort of that red thread of holiness we got away from in the early church, now we're seeing a return of it in some cases. Yeah, as far as, <coughs> say a little more, What's the red thread of holiness? Back or the, holiness? The red thread is back, the holiness. Back to being led by yes. the Spirit. Absolutely. Back to communal language with God. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, mo most certainly. I think that's important. Yes. I don't have a question. I'm not even sure how to formulate this, but from what I'm hearing you, is the church was very communal, was very tight knit together. They stood together in their worship, and they stood together in the face of persecution and yes. trials. And I just, I just feel that the church today is very disconnected, very private, like members are very private, and I feel like the church is kind of has lost that, that unity, that <coughs> solidarity with one another. And I don't know how we can really stand together in 
worship authentically in spirit and in truth if we're so divided, we're disconnected, and if persecution comes or so on. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, no, I, mean, I think you you said it. Um, you you've absolutely said it, and and I don't know either, honestly. I mean, but I think it's something we have to we have to work towards. Um, and we we uh, we have to continue those those opportunities when we have to to engage in ecumenical dialogue or to you know to have church together. We pastored a small church in Ohio that was in the midst of some other smaller churches, and so every Lent season we would get together and we would go and worship at each other's churches and fellowship. Well, we only did it at that time of year, but it was this kind of profound experience of of unity. So even though we had churches from different denominations, this one time a year we came together, and it seems to me. That, that that's something that, that we have to be able to retrieve at, at, at some level. I don't know what that looks like, but I think it's something that we have to work towards. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm seeing this even more at a congregational level, like just the disconnect between members. Sure, mm-hmm. sure. I wonder what constructive mm-hmm. things we can take from the book of Revelation to kind of enhance our worship and our unity, even within the local church, as we stand together to worship God. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Mm. It really is. Let me think about that. Last one, okay. Amina. Uh, just in the light of what Dr. Khan and Dr. Martin said, uh, and in terms of this uh, apocalyptic concept that you talked about, and also thought of the ecumenical currents uh, right now, so do you see this shared experience of worship as the primary sit right over here. Feel free to come by and, and have a chat with her. There are books for sale.